All right, I'd like to welcome you to use your chat box heavily. Um, we want to hear your questions and your comments and have a chance to interact with you using the chat box. Um, we will begin with a short intro and then from there, Dr. Garza and Ms. Rocha will take uh, the event forward for us, hopefully at the end. Uh, we'll have some time for interaction so that if you have a burning question or something that you'd like for Dr. Garza to answer for you, we'll have time to do that at the very end. But to start us off, if you would, just stick in the chat box who you are, where you're from, how did you come about coming to the event today? Um, did you receive an invitation? Did you read about it on social media? How did you find us today? Let us know that in the chat box. So if you'll give me a moment, I'd like to uh, share a short video with you and then we will begin. <laughs> A long, long time ago, there was an upper world and a lower world. And in the upper world were all the things of Mother Earth, the trees, the hills, the animals, the birds, everything except the people. At that time, the people were spirits in the underworld. But one day, an entity took off her head and threw it into the sky, and it became the moon. So then the moon started having this effect on the earth, and that effect was so powerful that it reached into the underworld, and all of a sudden the spirits became people, <laughs> but they were in the underworld, and they had to somehow get up onto the upper world where Mother Earth was. So the people prayed, and a deer appeared to them, and the deer led them through the underworld. They went through rocks and crevices and mud and earth and all kinds of obstacles until they came to a portal that they could see above them was full of water. And so the deer started swimming up through the portal. So the people grabbed onto the deer and the deer grabbed onto the people and they were swimming and swimming up through that portal. At the same time, it was a water bird flying over on Mother Earth, flying over these springs. So the Waterbird dove into the water and grabbed the deer and grabbed the people and pulled them up onto the shores of Mother Earth. And that's how the people first came to be on Mother Earth. So we believe that that portal, that crevice, is the headwaters of the San Marcos River, which we call the Sacred Springs. We believe that because it's documented on a 4,000-year-old rock art painting that's near Comstock, Texas where it shows four fountain springs on that rock painting. And there's a line that curves and hits right at that second spring and points to it as the creation site. So that's why we believe that that's the spring that we came out of. My name is Maria Rocha. And I'm the executive director of Indigenous Cultures Institute. I'm also a member of the Miyakan Garza tribe, which is my husband's tribe. I am. Thank you so much for joining us today. At this moment, I'm going to give uh, the entire event into the hands of Dr. Garza and. Ms. Rocha, thank you. I'm an um, everyone. Dr. Mario Garza currently serves as Board of Elders Chair and is the principal founder of the Indigenous Cultures Institute, which is a profit. We have 12 programs, and our mission is to preserve the culture of Native Americans, Indigenous to Texas. Thekans, the original Texas Indians. So he is also the cultural preservation officer of the Miyakan Garza Band 
and that's a state legislature recognized tribe of Texas. Dr. Garza earned his doctorate in social science from Michigan State University with areas of concentration in sociology, political science, and social work. He has been active in Native American issues for over 40 years. He currently lives here in Marcus, Texas, near the Sacred Springs, the geologist believed to be the oldest continuously inhabited site in North America. Yomanam, all is good. Dr. Garza? Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome, everybody. For my PowerPoint. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. I'm going to be talking about the, or the indigenous people of Texas. And uh, most of you are think that I'm talking about the Hispanics in Texas, but they happen to be one the same. Just bear with me and we'll, I'll explain everything. Um, the mission of ICI is to promote and preserve the culture of Native Americans indigenous to Texas and Northern Mexico and to maintain our covenant with sacred sites. Start by saying that we have three, three Indian reservations in Texas, but not those reservations are, are original Texas Indians. Uh, we have the Alabama Cachara, and they came from Alabama. We have the, uh, the and they came from New Mexico, and we have the uh, the Kikamu that came from uh, Illinois. I'm getting a cramp in my leg, but that happens when you start getting old. But anyway, so I want to I'm going to start by uh, t talking about how we became or what happened to the Texas Indians. Uh, if you could go back to the uh, settling of North America and South America, we were settled by Sp by Spain, and so <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about how all of that happened. But before I do that, I wanted to talk about a myth that a lot of people still believe, and that is that when the Spaniards came down, that the conquistadores intermarried with the native indigenous people and produced what is called the mestizo, and that is the descendant of the present day Hispanics and Latinos. And mestizo is a word that is given to a person that is half uh, Spanish and half indigenous. But even before we go there, I wanted to talk about a very important uh, papal bull. And uh, for those of you that are not Catholic, might not know what a papal bull is. A papal bull is a, uh, a document by the Pope. And they have been doing that ever since the beginning of time. And this was a papal bull was done, it's called uh, Romulus Pontifex. And it was issued in 1452 by Pope Nicholas V. And so this was uh, 50 years before 1492. So even before Columbus came here, they had already talked about, you know, what they expected of all the uh, countries that were coming from Europe. And if you remember, the uh, Christianity or the Catholic Church was in control of the known world at that time. So pretty much the papal bull was considered the final authority, or a lot of people believe that it was the word of God. Declare war against all non-Christians throughout the world. It sanction and promote the conquest the colonization and the exploitation of non-Christian nations and their territories. 
So because they believed that non-Christians were considered enemies of the Catholic faith and as such were less than human. That attitude that the people in, in other parts of the world that were non-Christians were less than human and that being the indigenous people. And even today, there's the mentality that indigenous people are less than human. You can see that in the uh, declaration of, of uh, our declaration of uh, when we've established the United States, that humans, that native people are barbaric and that implies they were less than human. And all the official documents of the United States will, will specifically state or even imply that indigenous people are less than the Europe than the white Christian Europeans. Okay, now I want to talk about all these countries got together and decided on ten elements of discovery, which was going to be sort of like a law that they were. And, but without going into all 10 of them, I'm just going to talk about the first two, which pertains to my lecture. So the first discovery was that a nation first had to discover, or what Europeans call discover, in a, some new land. And if it was new for them, they felt that they were discovering it. It did not matter that that land was had been uh, occupied by other people or had government or any type of civilization. If it was the, the first time that a European nation uh, went there, then they felt that they had discovered. That's why we have that myth about Columbus discovering America and actually Columbus never had foot in any of the North or South uh, continent. But people believe that he discovered this uh, two co uh, continents because he was the first European, supposedly the first European to see those continents, but actually he was not the first one. Uh, Eric, um, Previous explorer was the first one who came here. And the second element to this loss of discovery was that if you discovered a uh, some land, you had to actually occupy and possess the land so you can gain complete legal title to the land. So I'm just going to be talking about those first two uh, requirements. Okay. Spain took possession and spread her culture, her religion, her law, her language over the Caribbean and more than half of the two North American continents. The two American continents. So there was a lot of land that Spain uh, claimed. The problem with that, as opposed to the other countries who lay claim to other parts of the United States in the north and, and east, was that they had people that came with them and they settled it and took possession of that. Spain did not have enough people to come over and settle it to take possession of it. Spain needed citizens to do that, for the, to claim this land. And so what they did, unlike all the other countries, they used the local indigenous people to do that. Basically, two techniques or methods that they used to colonize the people. The first one was the encomienda system. And this was a system that was very similar to the plantation system that was used in the South that started the slave, the slave of African American slaves in, in, in that part of our country. And the encomienda system 
started making slaves of the local indigenous people. And what they did, they, uh, they took away their, their culture and name and they started Christianizing all the inhabitants. They would round off all the people. It didn't matter what type of situation they would encounter. If it was just uh, hunter gatherers, or if it was a very advanced civilization, they, <clears throat> they would gather them in the in the middle of town and would tell them. And, well, first they would kill all the leaders. They would uh, identify all the leaders, and they would kill all the leaders. And then they would tell the rest of the people that they had two choices. One was to become uh, baptized and become Christians. And in exchange for that, for the Spaniards saving their soul, that they would that they would uh, take the land or giving them the reward of going to heaven. And so a lot of them uh, decided to become Catholic for the sake of survival. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been in situations where you notice that survival is a strong motivation to stay to stay alive, and so a lot of them chose to become uh, Catholic and be baptized. And what happened with those people was that after several generations, they forgot the reason that they had become Catholic, and uh, a lot of those descendants of those people feel that it was because they believe in that. Uh, in Christianity was a true religion. Some, in, there's a lot of stories that a lot of the indigenous people, there's a particular story that one of the uh, local Indians asked the, the Spaniard, uh, what is heaven about? He said, are there going to be people like you in heaven? And he said, oh yes. And so the, the indigenous person said, well, I don't want to go to heaven then, so go ahead and burn me alive. So that that individual person was born burned alive because he didn't want to go to heaven where there were going to be other Spaniards there. And I don't know how true that story is, but I personally want to believe that that happened in some case. The other the other system that was used was the mission system. And this was a system that where they started using the children of the indigenous people and started teaching them Spanish and, uh, and to, so they could start taking away their indigenous language. Because the language helps you maintain the culture. And so they started trying to take the language Away from the uh, from the indigenous people, and then also they started baptizing them and giving them the name of the uh, of the missionary in charge of the mission, or some of the other soldiers that were there at the mission. So there was a very effective technique. They Christianized and gave a lot of the indigenous people. Uh, Spanish names and took away their language. And even now, as I've been doing presentations for a lot of years, and people in the audience say, well, I have to be Spanish or descendant of the Spaniards because my I have a Spanish last name and I speak the Spanish language. And so I tell them, I said, this is a this is an, a, an effect of the colonization period. I mean, this is what happened a lot to the descendants of the African-American slaves that were part of the, the, the plantation system, like the encomendada systems that we were, or the mission system. I said, to me, that's very similar to a African-American person saying, I must be white because I have a white name like Jesse Jackson, uh, I, I only speak the white man language. So that 
rationale that some people use doesn't make sense to me. And we can discuss that at the end of the presentation. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the mid. Uh, maybe, maybe now we can call it a, uh, uh, what's in those theories they're called? Anyway, I'm getting old, I'm getting to forget a lot of my labels. Okay, so Mr. Ha if you can look at the drawing there, the person in the middle is supposed to be a mestizo. So you can see, on, on, you know, uh, above him, you can see Spanish, a Spanish person representing half of his heritage being Spanish. And on the other side, you see an indigenous person implying that the other half of his heritage is, is indigenous. So a mestizo is supposed to be a product of the Spaniards inter bearing with the Spaniards, with the indigenous people, I'm sorry. But it's a, uh, to start with, there was always an insufficient number of Spaniards that came, that came down. There were only about 600, according to studies, there were only about 600 to 900 Spaniards that accompanied Juan Cortes in 50, 1521. He was able to build it, to uh, conquer the Aztecs and because he was accompanied by a lot of uh, indigenous people that at that war were, uh, in, that, uh, Indians, indigenous people that were at war with the Aztecs. The Tresplanets were a very famous group that were fighting the uh, Aztecs. And they also uh, stayed with uh, the Spaniards and helped them come and uh, colonize the other indigenous people. And they also spoke uh, Nahuatl, which was the language that was spoken by the Aztecs. So that's one reason we find a lot of uh, Nahuatl words in the Mexican language. There was always a deliberate separation of races, but there were a few mestizos that resulted from the rape of native women. In, uh, a lot of the native people did not like the Spaniards for several reasons. One was that they, the indigenous people were used to bathing every day. So they were a very clean people and the Spaniards had a very bad hygiene habits. And so the, in a lot of the old paintings and drawings, you see a lot of the Indians, you know, holding their nose when they're talking to Europeans because they just uh, could not stand the way that the Europeans smell at that time. But current, well, old Spanish records document that native women aborted Spanish sired babies or committed suicide to avoid the sunner. Now, there's a very delib deliberate separation of races, especially at that time, racial mixing was reviled in 16th century New Spain. They believed in pure blood to keep the blood pure, or what they say in Spanish, sangre pura. And even today, you can see that there's a deliberate separation of races. The glowing physical and cultural differences still exist in Mexico. If you look at all the presidents of Mexico, you will see this on the left, there's a picture of the current president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. And on the right, it's a picture of Benito Juarez, which is considered to be the, the only indigenous person to ever become president of Mexico. 
He's always he's also famous for a very famous saying that he did. And too bad we're not doing this presentation in a uh, in a face to face because I would like to ask the group if they knew what that saying is. But the saying is that he said, "Poor Mexico, so far away from heaven." but so close to the United States. That gives you an indication of his feeling and attitude about the United States. Oh, by the way, uh, the current president of Mexico that you see here on the left has not accepted Joe Biden winning the presidency, which I'm surprised because as you know, President Trump had never been that friendly to the current country of Mexico. Well, anyway, so let's go back to how all of this started. So to start with, Texas used to be part of Mexico. So if you look at the map and you look at the pink areas, and, and it's kind of hard to recognize where Texas is because he doesn't have the traditional shape of the current state of Texas, which is very famous shape. But, and at that time, Texas was part of another state that is, and you see it on the right, sort of like the, you know, the top pink part on the right, and it says Coahuila y Texas. So the, the large state used to be called Coahuila and Texas, and later that divided up into the, the, the present state of Coahuila in Mexico and the present state of Texas in the United States. There's a lot of people that have, that have problems pronouncing the word Coahuiltecan. So a way that I help them be able to pronounce it is I tell them, are you familiar with the Mexican state of Coahuila? And they say, yes. I say, well, can you say Coahuila? And they say, yes, Coahuila. I said, okay, just say Coahuiltecan. And that's the easy way to learn how to say Coahuiltecan. Okay, so Texas, Mexico at that time, you know, Mexico started allowing some uh, Anglo settlers to come in and settle in Mexico. And Mexico was against having slaves. So the uh, people that had settled in Texas wanted to keep, to keep uh, slaves. So they decided to their independence from Mexico. And that was the, the bottom line reason for Texas wanting to become a republic. Sometimes you might read about some other reasons, but basically it had to do with slavery, just like the Civil War basically had to do with slavery. So Texas became a republic in 1840, and at that time, that was the, the 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 red was the shape and size of Texas at that time. And so, let's mention a few towards indigenous people in Texas. And understand. What I'm going to get to at the end, that there's no original Texas Indians with federal recognition in Texas. So the Texas Rangers, I mean, are very famous. And I'm not talking about the baseball team. I'm talking about the actual uh, Texas Rangers. They were founded in, 19, in 1823 by Stephen F. Austin. And a political reason that is given is to protect the Anglo settlers from Mexicans and Indians. 
which is a which is a diplomatic way of saying, but the real reason that the Texas Rangers were founded or started by Stephen F. Austin was to kill Anglo to kill Mexicans and Indians. And they just went around Texas hanging Mexicans and Indians. And there's there's a, a lot of study that done that have a lot of photographs of Texas Rangers surrounding a lot of bodies of Mexicans and Indians. We know this uh, indigenous person who claims to be the grandson of an indigenous person, the member of the Texas Rangers. And I don't know if he doesn't know the history of the Texas Rangers, but to me, it's very interesting that he brags about his grandfather being a Texas Ranger. And not only was he a Texas Ranger, which I thought that the highest rank that you could achieve in the Texas Rangers was a captain. But anyway, this person claims that his grandfather was a general in the Texas Rangers. I'm not going to say his name. Uh, so, by the five, Texas was, was, became part of the United States. And most remained in indigenous people went underground and passed Mexicans for the sake of survival. Okay, I, I skipped a very important section here. This, the, the second president of the Republic was Mirabeau B. Lamar. And he instituted a policy of total extinction or total expulsion of Texas Indians. That's very important. Let me repeat that. Mirabeau B. Lamar had a policy to kill all the Indians in Texas or to get them out of Texas. And that has affected that Texas has no Texas Indians with federal recognition. And you might say, so what? Well, to us personally, it's a very big problem because Maria mentioned when she introduced me that we have 12 programs. One of the 12 programs, which is one of the most important programs and we have been very active with that program for over 40 years and that's repatriation. And repatriation case is to recover remains of our people that have been removed and we rebury them. And the reason we feel that we're obligated to do that is because according to spiritual beliefs of most indigenous people, especially those who are traditional or still have whole culture and policy and, and, and beliefs, is that when a person dies, only the physical body dies. And you bury the, 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 the body of that indigenous person, and then after time, the body starts integrating and becoming part of Mother Earth, and it becomes connected to the, to the land, to the trees, to the water, and all that. So that's a very important part that we believe in. The other very important part is that when the person dies, the spirit doesn't die, and it starts a spiritual journey. It's or remove, it interrupts the spiritual journey of that spirit of that indigenous person. So that spirit is just going to be out there in limbo, floating in agony, in pain, in pain, not in pain, in pain. And so we feel we have an obligation to re all those remains. 
And the problem is that there's a law that was passed in 1990, October the 16th, in three more days, is going to be. Oh, huh? oh, November. Well, I'm sorry, it's November. November 16th. And it's going to be 30 years since that law was passed. Because now there's over 7 million remains of our people. 7 million that have been removed and are in cardboard boxes on shelves in institutions, museums, universities, state and federal groups that are all over the United States. Here in Texas, over 3,500 remains have been removed. Out of those 3,500, over 2,400 are at the University of Texas in Austin. And right now we have this big uh, situation of fight going with UT Austin, trying to get three remains from, from Hayes County to return, to return them. And uh, one thing about Lamar, he has been honored a lot in pretty much every city or little town in Texas, either a school or street named after Lamar. Okay, so you read a lot about the Trail of Tears, about how a lot of Indians were moved out of their traditional homeland and were moved to Indy or Oklahoma. But we also had a lot of, you know, a lot of Indians being removed from Texas. But you never read about that in any Texas history book. Why is that? Okay, so when Texas joined the United States in 1845, and you can see the blue, which has the current shape of Texas, and at that time, it was, it was part of New Mexico, part of that. And so by the time that Texas became part of the United States, all the Indians in Texas have been either moved out or killed or, or colonized and no longer accepted as indigenous people. So we had lost all our land, all our sacred sites. So we did not have any land for the United States government to sign any treaties with us for our land and recognize us as Indians. So we ended up with none of the Indians getting federal recognition. And I mentioned that we have this problem with repatriation. And the problem with that is that a lot of the institutions or collectors of our people, they do not want to recognize us as Indians because we're not federally recognized and they do not want to return the remains of our people. We're claiming remains that were moved from, in this case with UT from Hayes County, our original homeland for over 14,000 years. So we're still having that problem. Now, let me switch a little bit and talk about how a lot of the current Hispanics, which is a personally don't like, but that we still have, that a lot of our indigenous identity has survived. But one thing, 75% of the food and nutrition that is used worldwide was contributed by the native people in Central and South America. There you see avocados and, and, and a strawberry. All the berries that we use now were contributed by our people. 
This is one thing that a lot of that you're not going to read in the history books is that when the when the Spaniards came down to to the Americas, we had some areas that were very highly developed, and we had universities, we had libraries, we had uh, indoor plumbing, we have uh, electric, you know, like we had electricity, we had uh, organ transplants. We were using uh, sterile fields when we were doing surgery. And all of that was, they tried to destroy all that knowledge. Okay, another thing about that, I mentioned this before, that the Spanish language that was left over, especially Mexican Spanish, have many words that are called Aztecisms or Mexicanisms or which are actually loan words borrowed from Nawa. And some of those are, are steps that did not exist in the Spanish culture, like aguacate, uh, atole, catahuate, camote, coyote, chiles, chocolate. We invented or started domesticating chocolate. What would you be giving your sweetheart in Valentine's Day if it had not been for the chocolate that was developed by the indigenous people in, in Central America? We also are the only people that have genetically engineered a food which is corn. We combine two different grasses and develop corn and we form a covenant with the corn that we will keep uh, planting corn if they would keep sustaining us. We also domesticated the guajolote or the turkey. So what would be eating during Thanksgiving and that's coming around the corner, what would be eating if we didn't have turkey. And then tamales. And tamales was an invention of our people. And I'd like to tell the story of why tamales were invented. And tamales were invented to preserve the meat inside the tamal. If you're familiar with tamales, you know that it's that you use a cornmeal and it covers the meat and it seals it and that preserves it. So you can travel with tamales and you don't have to refrigerate them and it preserves the, the meat, whether it's beef or pork or chicken or javeline or, or venison or turtle or whatever. Tomates, and then we have, and this supposed the picture is supposed to be about the mud. So can't they? Not about the pig. Some other very important words in our in our culture that are that are not in regular Spanish, but in our Mexican Spanish is chamaco, huarache, cuate. You can recognize the two Castro twins, Joaquin and, and, uh, and Julian. And then the, uh, you see these three people picking cotton, and the, and the there is about piscar, which means picking cotton. And then you see uh, uh, zacate. And then another contribution to the language is when you double words, Mero mero, luego luego, muy muy, or use the use diminutive and argumentative words, chiquito, chiquitito, chiquitito, words like that. That's a contribution from the indigenous people. Three very important parts of the indigenous culture that have survived are purification lodges which are the sweat lodges, 
Latin American dance societies, which to us, dancing is praying, and the religious use of peyote. I wanted to mention here that the United States outlawed all our ceremonies. And so it was not until 1978, until I was 35 years old, that they made some of these ceremonies legal. And I'm sure most of you are familiar, or have at least heard about sweat lodges. I'm 77 years old, and I've, I've had two friends my age that went to prison for participating in a sweat lodge. And now you read about non-Indian people paying a lot of money, in some cases up to $2,000 to participate in a sweat lodge. We have a lot of Native American dance societies that some of them, most of them have been co-opted by the Catholic Church. And we have the religious use of peyote, which is, has become the Native American church. Which is of sweat lodges where you have the uh, the cover or the frame built from willow trees because they're very flexible. And then you have the fire outside where you hit up the uh, lava stones, which we call grandfathers. When they're red hot, you take him into the center of the lodge and the person running the sweat lodge starts pouring water on them to make the sweat hotter. the surviving indigenous dance societies. We have the Matachines, which are, have become a Catholic dance. We have the Mexica or the Aztec dancers, which we have in our powwow. So by the way, we have a, a, a Virgil powwow right now. You can go to sspowwow.com and check our powwow and you'll see, you know, some besides the traditional powwow dancers, you'll see some Aztec dancers. And use of peyote, uh, which is now the Native American church. In the center, you see uh, Juana Parker, a very famous Comanche that operated the Native American church. And he called it a church to make it legal because he knew that when the, the government was used to seeing Indians praying or dancing, they would send the army to kill them. So he called it, he incorporated it in 1910 as a Christian church. And there you see the, the garden spirits of what we call the medicine. You see the, the, the jaguar that plants the medicine in the ground. You see the deer that gets it out and distributes it among the people. And then you see the wolf that teaches the people about the ceremony. And then on the top right, you see a image of a water bird, which represents the medicine. Which, by the way, my last name Garza means water bird. Okay, so what are the implications and consequences? So well, let's look at some claims for justice. Here you see somebody crossing the border and trying to hide his tracks. And one of the most common, not the most common, but one of the, the worst insults that you can give 
an indigenous person from South Texas or Mexico is to call him an hijo de la chingada. And I don't know how many of you know Spanish, but that's considered to be a very, a very big insult. And I remember as a kid, whenever somebody was told that, it also resulted in a, in a fight. And the reason for that is because the rape word in Nawa, the word, the Nawa word for rape is chingada. So an hijo de la chingada means a, a son of a rape, a descendant of a, of a, of a indigenous woman that was raised by a Spanish conquistador. So when we denied our native heritage, I'm talking about Texas natives, we overlooked the brutal crimes and atrocities committed by the Europeans, for example, murder, rape, slavery, plunder of natural resources, ethnocide, and genocide. So when we denied our native heritage, we become one of the native victims who identifies with their conqueror and oppressor. And there are some of our people that do not want to admit they're indigenous and they want to be white. And they anglicize their last names. But when we denied our native heritage, we condone the idea that indigenous is equated with ugliness, backwardness, inferiority, and poverty. So some of our people mistakenly believe that if they stick their indigenous, they're gonna be inferior and they're gonna stay poor. But we, a lot of us have succeeded. We go from here. One thing that we try to teach people when we do our presentations and our summer camp, and we especially when we work with, with young people, we, we teach them that they need to learn their history, their true history, and they need to embrace their heritage. They need to recognize and live by their indigenous values of community first. That's one difference about our, our culture is that the community comes first. We do not believe in that the individual comes first, like in the, in the, in the general uh, uh, mainstream culture, but the community comes first. We are we're supposed to honor our relationships, especially being true to our word, and we need to be responsible to protecting Mother Earth. So we teach them that our, the indigeneity is a gift that you take with you everywhere you go. It's a unique perspective to your job, holistic solutions to problems, collaborative approaches to teams, genuine interconnected and lasting relationships. Uh, we need to be honorable and truthful with our word and we need to be grounded in community and service. We need to feel some responsibility to our community and provide whatever services we can to our community. So again, as I've been saying all along, that as the consequences of our unique history and socialization, there are no original Texas Indians that are federally recognized. So thank you, and Yomanam. Yomanam means uh, all is good. Okay. We're trying to get back to you guys. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> No pictures, just little letters there. <laughs> okay, so uh, now uh, we're open for questions and comments. 
So Dr. Garza, we've had several of our attendees say how amazing the presentation was and um, to thank you for sharing because much of the information that you shared uh, was not widely known. Um, one of the questions that uh, came forward as I was listening to you um, is what about Thanksgiving? We hear uh, that some nations do not celebrate Thanksgiving um, because it has been changed into something that it was not. Um, could you tell us a little, we're coming close to uh, Thanksgiving now. Could you tell us a little bit about um, how you see Thanksgiving? Okay. Let me answer that in a, in a few ways. One is that the story about the first Thanksgiving that happened to me. The people that were supposed to have Thanksgiving with the native people there ended up trying to kill all of them. So this thing about there was a Thanksgiving is not true. Another thing about that group of pilgrims, I was, I was doing my, I was doing some research on my repatriation, which I mentioned is one of our top programs. And the first robbing, the first recorded robbing of a native grave happened in Cape Cod by the pilgrims. Less than four days since they arrived in, in Cape Cod, they were walking around, they saw a native grave, and they went and robbed it. They took away the remains, they took away because they, they we buried a lot of items with the remains of our people. And so they took away the, the, the grains and the corn and the food products that were buried with the remains. So this was the first recorded disturbance of a native grave, and that was by the pilgrims, the ones that are supposed to have the Thanksgiving with the indigenous people. And, and it was not until I forgot the number, but like 368 day, years later, a descendant of those Indians filed a claim through NAPRA, the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, to regain those remains, to rebury them, and all the other stuff that was, that was stolen at that time. So, and to, to mention other things about Thanksgiving, according to our culture, and a lot of different, you know, a lot of our people have been colonized and, and all that stuff in a lot of different ways to a lot of different levels. But we are always, part of our culture is to give thanks every day. So we start our day from by by giving thanks for another day and giving thanks for being allowed to be there and that is why we teach our our you know our kids at the summer camp every morning we would start the day by doing the we had a, a one of our young dancers with a conch you know blowing to the four winds and then the upper and the downward in the center, and with, so we would give thanks for, for being allowed, for being there, and we would give thanks for being allowed to be, to be, and to be there. So part of our culture is to be thankful every day. I mean, when we sit down to eat, and then we would teach the kids this, when we would sit down for lunch, which was provided free by the schools by the school district, that we would give thanks for the food. <clears throat> so 
and the people who planted the food and brought it over and cook it and all that stuff. So we are we teach our people, our kids, to be thankful for everything. If, you know, for every day, if we go for the day, everything that happens in the day. So this thing about one day out of the year being thankful, a lot of our people are thankful, you know, just to have rice and beans. You know, we, uh, we're very fortunate that we can afford to buy turkey and we already went to H-E-B and bought a turkey before they ran out and we have it in the freezer ready to, to cook because we're going to stay home and just cook for the two of us and have some leftover turkey, maybe. And so, so a lot of the, the tribes do not celebrate the traditional one day Thanksgiving because we celebrate, we give thanks every day. Thank you for that. Um, we also just finished um, being very thankful for the protection that the veterans of this country provided for us. And we know that you also served um, as a member of our military service here. Um, there are also so many um, of the indigenous people throughout this land who served uh, in the military to help preserve the freedoms that are here. Um, would you talk to us a little about your military service and even your service here at Fort Hood? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I was in the army. I, um, I was with a medical clearing company in Vietnam. My first assignment was being assigned to a hospital in Berlin, which was considered to be the best European or overseas assignment. But being young and crazy, I decided to volunteer for Vietnam. And so I was sent to a military clearing company. And we, took care of general first aid. We were across from the hospital and the hospital was taking, taking care of the, of the wounded, of the casualties. And we were taking care of the everyday sick call, even sunburn. I mean, some, you know, some, People got a little crazy, stay out in the sun too long, and ended up with sunburn. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, since, I, since I was in Vietnam, I, I know more about Vietnam soldiers. And when I was in Vietnam, the indigenous population was 1% of the total United States population. But we were two percent of the of the people in the military, and also because we have this made or stereotype or whatever of being of being warriors, and that's another reason that a lot of us volunteer for the service because we, we do come from, uh, from this belief that we feel that we need to protect our people, that we need to protect our country, even though the country has not been too friendly towards us. So because of that, we ended up being put in a lot of combat jobs or MO, what we call MOS, military uh, something. And so looking at PTSD, one out of five Vietnam soldiers had PTSD, ended up with PTSD. With native people, four out of five 
of us ended up with PTSD. As opposed to one out of five, there were four out of five for us. And that has a lot to do with, you know, being in, 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 in some combat situations, you know, doing things that are not normal according to our upbringing. And also, we also, be, you know, believe in honoring life. And we believe that everything is, everything is alive and, and, and we should honor all lives. Like even, like we, we believe that rocks have, you know, are alive and they have a life. We believe that trees, well, trees are very obviously alive, but water, trees, and, but even the, the elements, you know, are alive. We believe that Mother Earth is a sentient living being. And that's why we believe that we need, that it feels pain when we drill for oil, and that's why we need to we need to protect Mother Earth. Oh, yeah. When I was in Vietnam, you know they 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 try to they try to socialize you in a lot of ways to to make you hate the enemy and kill the enemy. So. Whenever soldiers, and I'm talking about I'm, uh, soldiers, I'm talking about people in the army, you know, not, not my, you know, not sailors or air force or whatever. So when we, 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 the army went out, they would say, okay, let's go out to Indian country. You know, you go out to Indian country to kill the enemy, you know, so, and the thing is that to me, a lot of the Vietnamese people look like us. So, so a lot of those things affected us. We, um, we truly appreciate all that uh, you have had to endure and especially the things that um, you hold sacred that have not been shared and that most people don't even know how to ask um, or to respectfully come and want to know more. Um, there is a fear sometimes that if uh, I ask a question, I may offend you by asking that question. So many times people won't um, ask those questions, but we appreciate everything that you've shared with us. And I've had people in the chat say that they want to continue to connect with you um, so that they will also know more. So we will make available to them the information that we have for you, your email and information on your YouTube videos that will direct them to the powwows and and how to connect with you uh, once the event is done as well. So I wanted to give everybody one last opportunity to ask any questions uh, that they may have at this point. But I'd also like to give you an opportunity to close us out um, however you see fit. Uh, everyone know that this video will also live on our TAM UCT YouTube channel as well as our diversity webpage. So for those who were not able to be with us, um, they will still be able to share with us uh, by watching the recording. So um, Dr. Garza, if you will close us out however you see fit, um, and then I will also continue to monitor the chat to see if there's anything that anybody needs from you before we close. What about another one? Let me, uh, let me go get my rattle. Um, this is awesome. <laughs> we were hoping to sing a traditional song so that um, you can hear the language and uh, experience some of the spiritual aspects. 
so um, for Dr. Garza, when to get his rattle, because he usually sing with a rattle. I would like to make a comment. Um, if there are some Hispanic students or people of Hispanic descent. Um, I wanted to make one last comment about the information that Dr. Garza gave out about the way that um, that our history played out in Texas, which is unique and special and different. That is that the the um, the person that is labeled Hispanic or Latino or Latinx today started off as an indigenous person. And then the Spaniards came and they became the same indigenous people were renamed Spanish subjects. And then the same indigenous people when Mexico was created became Mexicans, but it's, they didn't mix with anybody. They just changed their label to Mexican. And then when Texas came along, they became Tejanos, so their label changed to Tejanos. Then it was incorporated to the United States, and then they became Mexican Americans. Then during one of the census periods, they became Hispanic. They were labeled Hispanic, same indigenous people, very little mixing of any culture or, or bloodlines or lineage. And then we decided to rename ourselves Latinos. So Every label that we've had has moved us farther and farther and farther away from our actual heritage, which is indigenous. And this indigenous heritage and this whole historical progression is not taught to any of our Hispanic children in Texas. And we are now more than 50% of the children in the Texas public schools are Hispanic kids, right? So our children are indigenous children that don't know they're indigenous. That's one of the reasons why we provide this information to people so that they begin thinking about how this systemic injustice exists because of lack of knowledge, because of school systems not teaching um, the children about their culture. And this is not just indigenous children, but all children of color are are missing their culture in schools because it's not a regular part of their school. They don't see a lot of black literature, a lot of indigenous literature, a lot of Asian literature. They don't see um, those faces, their faces on the walls. They see heroes who are white heroes and white history. And so all of that multicultural beauty and information is not passed down to these children in Texas. Of course, in the entire United States has this problem, right? But here in Texas, where we are a majority of the people, the people of color in Texas are the majority now. Yeah. We're living uh, without any of our culture being taught to us. So for everyone to be thinking about this, because you are in um, a university system where your education is preparing you to deal with the systems in the United States, the systems in Texas, and for you to have a grasp of what that system is doing to a majority of its citizens is important so that you can be part of that systemic change that's going to open doors and open knowledge and open new ways of looking at solutions for society, right? So I'm hoping that uh, you'll take away some of this information in those terms. So there's no more questions. So I have no other questions, but I do want to let everybody know that at A&M Central Texas, there is in our sociology department a course on Native American history. So make sure you look for, for that information and we will continue to stay connected to Dr. Garza and Ms. Rocha to make sure that we keep this conversation going. So thank you so much. And Dr. Garza, the rest of the time is yours. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, to 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 repeat what you said that if anybody has any questions, you know, they can email us or call us. Uh, we have a website, we have Facebook, we have 
we just started uh, TikTok, and so we got several news media uh, applications, and so they can get in touch with us on at that. And I want I wanted to to you know I usually keep getting all this thoughts. I wanted to mention that you know the United States was was uh, formed basically for religious freedom and the Native Americans did not have religious freedom for a long time and then when they when they started the the Native American Religious Freedom Act it did not cover everybody you know it only covered mostly the federally recognized tribes so a lot of us that are not federally recognized still do not have religious freedom. Like in my in our ceremonies, uh, we cannot legally use eagle feathers, which we use for a lot of our ceremony. We cannot use, um, you know, items from uh, some of our garden spirits, protection animals. You know the jaguar uh, and some other some other animals. I'm not with better the way more. Um, so okay, well I'm gonna um, I I hope that that was the presentation was close to what something that you were expecting or wanting. Uh, so I'll go ahead and. Um, and close with a prayer song. Uh, I, uh, I mentioned that for us, dancing is prayer. And for us also singing, you know, we sing a lot of our prayers. And when we do ceremony, we, we sing in our native languages. And, uh, and the, and I believe that that is because our ancestors can hear us and join us and come and, and help us. So I'm going to do a, uh, a closing song in Powhatan. Yara yara yaya neo yara yara yaya neo yara yara yaya neo yaya neo yaya neo yaya Yana yi bamana pange, yana yi bamana pange, bamana pange, yana hele yowe, yana hele yowe. Ayi gampa ya yowe, ayi gampa ya yowe, ayi gampa ya yowe. to both of you and to everybody who had an opportunity to be with us today and share. Um, we are so grateful. We are thankful for you. As um, Dr. Garza shared with us earlier, um, we are thankful every day 
for our time here and for our time together. We know that we will never be the same um, from this day forward. So we think we are very thankful for being together and uh, for having a chance to share with you. So I hope that everyone enjoyed the presentation. I hope that you will also share widely uh, the information that we have on our web page and that you'll take time to go back and view the presentation again on YouTube. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. So please keep the conversation going. Continue to be safe and remember to take care of yourselves. Bye.